Второй наш докладчик на утреннем нашем заседании – это Терри Смит, профессор университета Питтсбурга и одновременно профессор Института экспериментальных искусств в Сиднее в Австралии. Кроме того, Терри живет между Сиднеем и Питтсбургом на двух континентах. И, кроме того, он является членом совета музея Энди Орхола в городе Питтсбурге. А в 70-е годы Терри Смит был одним из участников и основателей легендарной нью-йоркской концептуалистской группы Art and Language. Тема доклада Терри Смита – «Одна и три идеи двоеточия» концептуализм до, во время и после концептуального искусства. Мы, я попрошу теперь погасить свет, потому что мы будем картинки смотреть. I thank um, Boris Groys uh, for the invitation, the Stella Art Foundation, uh, Nikolai and everyone who's welcomed us here. Um, I should point out that this kind of discussion is occurring in many parts of the world to try and identify what is specific about conceptualism in different parts of the world and as Boris has just done, also try and relate that to the larger legacy. Um, I've been discussing this in Japan and in Canada in recent years, and it's uh, occurring everywhere. So, Nikolai, a question. Is it possible for some lights to appear for the audience to make notes? Um, is that possible? A нужен свет в зале, извините. А можно в зале чуть-чуть включить свет, чтобы люди могли записи делать какие-то. Сейчас, сейчас включат одну секунду. Окей. So, on the screen is um, one card from an exhibition of 1971 in Canada. That's okay? Yeah? Okay. Um, and I just, it's an exhibition called Inventory that was put together by Gary Card, uh, Coward. Arthur Bardo and Bill Vazan, uh, the latter two conceptual artists. And it was a whole series of cards. The exhibition consisted just of uh, little note cards um, distributed randomly and they formed a kind of card file catalog. They were kind of inventory. And one of them had this particular quotation from Quine. It alerts us to the fact that, are we okay for sound? Can you hear? Okay. Um, philosophers often add ism to a term in order to highlight a distinct approach to a fundamental question, that is to name a philosophical doctrine. When it comes to universals, the Oxford Dictionary of Philosophy tells us that, and I quote, conceptualism is a doctrine in philosophy intermediate between nominalism and realism that says that universals exist only within the mind and have no external or substantial reality. So the term conceptualism is a standard term in philosophy. There are other definitions uh, to it, but the point about philosophical doctrines is very clear. Um, the point of adding an ism to a term is to name a philosophical doctrine. For art critics and art historians and artists, however, isms have a different purpose. They name movements in art, broadly shared approaches that have become styles or are threatening to do so. During the hero heroic years of the modern movement, when critics, artists or art historians first added ism to a word, they usually meant what the suffix usually means in ordinary language. That's to say X is like Y, even excessively so. With ridicule as their aim, they highlighted a quality twice removed from the source, from authenticity. So impressionism and cubism were derogatory terms. 
But their success uh, as names led um, to a plethora of isms in the middle of the century. By the 1950s and 60s, anyone could generate an ism, and too many artists did so in their efforts to link their unique and often quite individual ways of working to what they or their promoters hoped would be market success or art historical inevitability. So when the artist Willem de Kooning at a meeting in New York in 1951 said, it is disastrous to name ourselves, he was a lone voice which was quickly silenced by the tide that named everybody present abstract expressionists. By the 1960s, this kind of naming had become so commonplace, so obvious a move, and such a sure pathway to institutionalization and incorporation that many artists sought to avoid it. It seemed to invite being comfortably slotted into a history of modernist avant-gardism that had become ossified. In the 1970s, for example, artists who were driven primarily by political concerns consciously blocked efforts to designate their work as belonging to a political art movement. So they anticipated what Boris just told you uh, uh, a few minutes ago. But we blocked that because we knew that once what we did was named political art, that would be really the end of it. But for some artists um, who were long excluded from any kind of historical recognition, this was a risk worth taking. So feminist artists during the 70s emphasized their feminism precisely because it connected their practice to the broader social movements to vindicate the rights of women. But artists, the, the group of artists who were most aware of the powers and the pitfalls of exactly these processes were conceptual artists. And we refused to embrace the term conceptualism during those decades. We were, however, happy to use the term conceptual small c conceptual for work and to tie this to the art that we were making because questioning the concept of art was precisely the main point of the practice. We also foresaw that the tag conceptual art, capital C, capital A, would inevitably, would inevitably be associated with the work and thus tie it too closely to art um, to, to the idea that our art had resolved the problems which it was setting. The goal was to keep art practice at a critical distance from the institution of art while having art as the focus of the work. So we therefore sought to undermine the naming of uh, the work we were doing by adopting one or two strategies. One was to insist that the term conceptual, capital C, be applied so broadly that it became meaningless, in other words, to any art that was no longer governed by a traditional medium, or applied so narrowly to only language-based art that dealt with art per se as to offend everybody else except ourselves. So it's interesting that the term conceptualism, which we're here to think about, really came into art world existence after the advent of conceptual art in the major centres in New York and London, most prominently in the exhibition Global Conceptualism uh, of 1999, which I'll talk about a bit more later. It came into existence mainly to highlight the fact that innovative experimental art practices had occurred in the Soviet Union, in Japan, in South America and elsewhere prior to at the same time as and after the European initiatives that had come to seem paradigmatic. It also wanted to emphasize the fact that these practices were more socially and politically engaged and therefore more relevant to the present and in these senses better art than the well-known European exemplars. And in that sense it was a claim that this art should be regarded as contemporary because at that time, conceptualism was the art form most valued. And so let's just call it um, uh, conceptual. But the real need, as I'll show again later, was to be regarded as contemporary. This also led to a kind of retrospection and recently 
uh, focus on minor movements in European American art, such as Fluxus, has benefited from this retrospection. So in the main part of my talk today, I want to go back to some remarks made by some of the key artists at the time. I wish to revisit the terms conceptual art, capital C A, and conceptualism as pointers to what was at stake in the unraveling of late modern art during the 1960s and to art's embrace of contemporaneity since then. So I'll talk in three parts. I'll say three general things. I'll ask what was conceptualism before conceptual art, during conceptual art, and after conceptual art, capital C A. And I'll show that there were usually one, um, there was at least one, usually two, and sometimes three concepts of conceptualism in play at each moment. These were in play differently uh, at different times and at different places during each of these moments. So let's begin from um, the question seen from within orthodox art historical narratives as a matter of the meaning of style, which is a concern of art historians. Starting from before conceptual art was named as a style and before conceptualism had any currency. And let's see what counted as conceptual art in that circumstance. I'll show you a work of Joseph Kassus from his art and ideas series. Ian Byrne, uh, conversation with me during an art language discussion. Actually, it was, on, it was in his house, away from an actual discussion. He said in late 1972, looking at works such as this by Joseph, which as you know is a dictionary definition of the word art, if these works were made in 1965, like Joseph claims, they were pop art. If they were made in 1967, 68, when they were exhibited, then they are amongst the first works of conceptual art, strictly speaking. In his essay of 1970, Conceptual Art is Art, Ian Byrne gave these works the latter dating and characterized them as key examples of the strict form of conceptual art because they were analytic of the nature of art, their minimal appearance um, being of, course, of minimal relevance um, and of no distraction, as Boris has just pointed out. Now, why did an artist, Ian Byrne, with such a critical attitude towards orthodox art history and its puerile dependence of, on style terms, why did he apply such a crude criteria to the work of a close colleague? Joseph's response is outrage at applying such anti-conceptual criteria to his work. I discussed it with him a month ago uh, in New York and he totally blew up during the dinner we were having. He said, for Christ's sake, I was an art student. I had the ideas at the time. I didn't have the resources to realize them. When I did have the resources a few years later, everybody was dating their work to the moment of the conception of the work. That was the new currency. So in a larger picture of the shift from modern to contemporary art, this indicates the importance of contemporaneity, of exactitude to the moment. One and Three Chairs, uh, famous work, um, is pop-like. You could see this as a work of pop art in the sense that it's a statement about what constitutes a sign. It's there all at once. It's as obvious as a Warhol icon. But it's also very subtle, as Warhol icons are. It, it's a conceptual questioning of what it is to see, of what an image might be, of what an idea looks like, um, as, of course, our key works by um, Rauschenberg, and I'll just show you some works involving chairs, which are also questions not just about painting or sculpture, but about what it is for an object uh, to be in the world and to be seen to be in the world. Uh, John's, Jasper John's, a work that has um, a movement within it by the hand, as you see up there. Uh, it's a similar gesture to adding a chair to a work, and Warhol, um, this, this great work of Warhol's usually shown on the ground uh, itself. Warhol himself was the most naked in setting out the uh, one visual idea at a time, showing an image as an idea 
demonstrating what a visual idea was in the culture, in American culture, in visual culture, in popular imagination, in what was called unart in America, and showing it to be, as David Anton pointed out, a kind of deteriorated image. To see in America at that time was to see through deteriorating imagery. We can make parallels, of course, to the work of um, Lydia Clark and Elia Seeker at around the same time, but at a very different place. It's a different kind of, um, of way of thinking about what an art concept is or how art relates to a concept, but it's parallel. So to ask whether One and Three Chairs is a work of pop art or conceptual art is a badly formulated question. It's based on a misunderstanding of the deeper uh, issues that are at stake in both kinds of work. Rather, what I'm suggesting to you is if we really look at what's going on in the work that I'll, I've just showed you, we can see that there were various kinds of conceptualization inspiring the most inventive artists of the late modern era. And the conceptual quality of their work is the most important part of it. So this is the first in sense in which the three ideas of what it is for art to be counted as conceptual could count as one idea. It's the term conceptual used in a, as a normal um, kind of adjective. And quite properly, this is a very basic usage that precedes any real usage of terms such as conceptualism or conceptual art in art discourse because they are derivative from it, from the normal sense of the word conceptual. And that permits me to make a proposition which I'll now put before you. I'm going to make three propositions that add up to something like a theory of conceptualism. So I'm actually doing something of the kind of work that we did in the 70s, although I thought about this in around 1980, the three propositions I'm putting to you. It's a paradoxical gesture to offer a theory of conceptualism. It's an impossible gesture. In fact, it can't be done, but I'm doing it. Um, the first part of a proposition is that at its various beginnings, conceptualism was a set of practices for interrogating what it was for perceiving subjects and perceived objects to be in the world. That's to say, it was an inquiry into the minimal conditions in which art might be possible. This is, I think, more basic than style terms like pop or minimalism or conceptual art. This is the first step of a kind of conceptualism um, of, uh, in late modern art. So that's proposition one. I've got two more to make. Here's the second one. The second one will come up when we look at the question of consequence, of putting forward art propositions and they being consequential. Because as I'll just argue now, you can put forward any propositions you like, but unless they have consequence, doesn't matter. Forget it. It's a lazy-minded idea to say that all art that evidently reflects its own medium, that does so in ways unusual enough to raise the question, is this art, qualifies as conceptual. In today's kind of sloppy art babble, any art that's result, that results from the artist having any kind of idea is often called conceptual. And in the broader sense, that's true enough. But in the broader sense, it doesn't get us anywhere near to the issues at stake in the 70s and the different kind of issues that are at stake now. It's just a blurred term. To make the difference, you have to show how particular works or groups of work or a set of protocols or a practice did these things consciously as opposed to by instinct, did them intelligently as opposed from intuitively, and did so effectively with impact and with consequence. So that whenever I talk to Joseph about Henry Flint being the first person to come up with the definition of concept art, which he did in 1961, and every art historian has to quote Henry Flint, Joseph goes mad again. Who was this Flint? Total nobody. Who'd heard of him? Who knew of him? Who cares what he said? So what if some 13th century painter threw ink around in ways that looked like Jackson Pollock or that Max Ernst did? Who cares? To Joseph, what counts is not who said what as a matter of plain record or what was done in some isolated adventitious circumstance. What matters is whether the utterance or the work, the proposition, 
counts in the dominant art discourse of the time. Now that's shifted, so we can talk about whether that's still the case or not. But it does alert us to the inter internal struggle amongst artists, critics and theorists, that's to say within art discourse itself, as to what was at stake in conceptual art and conceptualism in practices of art. So that when, um, in Joseph's famous statement, art after philosophy, he said, I quote, all art after Duchamp is conceptual in nature because art only exists conceptually. That's not to be taken to mean that all art influenced by Duchamp's strategies is conceptual and that other art is some other kind of art. It means that the other kind of art is not art precisely because it doesn't take on the challenge of framing new propositions about art and it doesn't frame them as art. Therefore, it's not art. It doesn't matter. It doesn't count. There's another interesting sense of Joseph's statement. It could mean that after Duchamp drew attention to the, to the fact that the conceptual core of all art that was consequential that means that all art of consequence made at any time, anywhere, is ipso facto. So all art that's interesting, whenever it was made, anywhere in the world, at any time, is in fact conceptual if it's interesting as art. That's, a, that's another interesting challenge. We could look at artists um, in the early 60s, such as Robert Morris, who has a very serious claim to consequence in works such as Card File, which pit the complexity of an actual life of a person against the limited information available in a description of a person, another great theme in Russian art. Um, but we have to ask, did Robert Morris go on with this kind of work? And the answer is no, he didn't. Not for at least some years. He went through phenomenology of perception and so on and so forth. He came back to it in his later work. If we look at work, such as Fluxus work by George Brecht, for example. Here's a chair work, a chair event, 1962. You've got three chairs. Each one of them, there's a found object placed on the chair or below the chair, giving each chair a different character. For me, for Joseph, this is too theatrical. This is not conceptual art. And for me, it's relatively slight work in, uh, in this framework that we're talking about. But Brecht does some wonderful, wonderful work, not this one. In Poland, Roman Apolka began his infinity series of paintings in 1965. He sized them to his studio doorway, had himself photographed beside each one as was completed. You know these works, he starts off with a number one, keeps repainting the uh, next number, and so on to infinity through his entire life. This is a total commitment to applying a routine to life, knowing that the two are fundamentally incompatible. This, may, this occurs all over the world during that time, and to me, it's one of the great legacies of conceptual art that makes an art practice distinct from a life practice, um, a practice of not just randomly or in self-indulgently taking your own photograph and putting it on the web, but committing yourself, for example, to take a certain photograph a certain time every day and doing it for the rest of your life or in the case of Emily Benkeser, a um, Hungarian artist, to sew a particular statement into a strip of tape uh, every day for the rest of your life, and so on. We're getting close to the core of a kind of conceptualism that's worthy of attention for serious young artists today. It's, it's to do something with rigor, and, but without cause, and to have a kind of implacable commitment in the face of meaninglessness. Um, that distinguishes, uh, I think, an art practice, or starts to distinguish it from an everyday life practice. Let's look more closely at some of the concepts, um, some of the ways in which the term was used during the um, central moment of conceptual art. We take Sol LeWitt. Everyone knows his, um, his definitions. For example, in the paragraphs of 1967, paragraphs on conceptual art, he says, in conceptual art, the idea or the concept is the most important aspect of the work. When an artist uses a conceptual form of art, it means that all of the planning and decisions are made beforehand um, and the execution is a perfunctory affair. 
the idea becomes the machine that makes the art. We have to ask, what did Saul Lewitt mean by idea or concept? And it's very clear when you look at works such as this, he meant a mental picture of a design idea for, a, for an object to be produced. He didn't mean concepts in general. He didn't mean them embedded in language. He didn't mean them in the way that we've been discussing them up to this point. It's very specific. When you read his sentences on conceptual art of 1969, uh, here's a handwritten version of the first um, sketch of those that he, he did. You're immediately thrown into a kind of more interesting and larger paradox. He says, conceptual artists are mystics rather than rationalists. They leap to conclusions that logic cannot reach. He goes on to say things like formal art is essentially rational. Irrational thought should be followed absolutely and logically. Now, the contrast between rationality and mysticism is a kind of weak one. I think it soon disappears, at least in uh, the States and most of Europe. More important is that we can see here an awareness of the reach, but also the limits of ideas and concepts narrowly defined. It's their potential to create chaos, disorder, and revolution that comes to be valued. Thus the, the, okay, and there are many examples of, um, uh, of that kind of approach. The ways in which you can apply routines um, to the uh, aspects of everyday life to, generate, to show and demonstrate the basic insanity of the way in which rational everyday life is mostly organized. And for example, the Canadian group General Idea here um, uh, produced this figure of the organization man uh, as nuts in their work called Pilot of 1977, and a white-on-white -white work, a very minimal work. This is the work called White AIDS, uh, number three of 1993. Okay, let's return to one of three chairs and see whether it meets the deeper criteria of what counts as conceptual art. As I said, in the most immediate sense, it's a clear demonstration of what a sign is. Signify ed plus signify er equals sign. In fact, there are two signifiers. It's all there at once. A rose is a rose is a rose. But he could have used other chairs, and he did in other circumstances use other chairs. He could have used a shovel, um, and in some works he did. And the work on the right obviously refers, that's Duchamp's um, in advance of the broken arm. That's the one that Joseph himself owns and has in his apartment in uh, Paris. This is an art about uh, other art. So one in three chairs is not a single object. It's a proposition about how to look at the ways in which images relate to uh, their definitions and their concepts at various uh, levels. It it's a kind of approach that really follows from the example of um, Ed Reinhardt, the idea of art as idea uh, as idea. A further step can be taken if we um, look at works such as this by um, Joseph, a photograph, photograph of photograph and definition of photograph. We're starting to move now beyond the sort of tautological structure to more like what we call a thesaurus structure. Um, uh, this is a work by Mel Ramsden, Secret Painting, made in Australia, where the statement is that the, con the con content of this work is invisible. It's a secret known only uh, to the artist. It then does become a question about the limits of painting uh, as a practice. What we're heading towards is the uh, a practice of art as a, as a practice of propositionality, of putting propositions, material-rooted propositions that are also have a provisional character to them. And that's what language-based conceptualism keeps referring, uh, recurring to. And in that sense, I agree with Boris about the language structure of this kind of work. It goes to that as its core, as an example in this work by uh, Dan Graham, March the 31st, 1966, which is a description of, if you like, spatial zooming to where he is uh, at that point. Um, from space through himself and, and out in the other direction. The point I made about um, objects and perception is also exemplified in this work by Ian Byrne. No object implies the existence of any other, which is stand in front, look at a mirror, and see yourself looking at that statement. 
As you look at the statement, you realise it's false because the object clearly employs you as a viewer um, looking at that work. Yoko Ono, and I'm sorry this is very hard to see, in 1961 already had, had this idea. Um, this is painting to let the evening light go through, and that's inscribed on a sheet of glass which she hangs in front of a window uh, for this particular work. Other works are a bit more resolute. This is Ian Burns' Xerox book of 1968, and this is a book that where each page is um, uh, Xeroxed or photocopied it picks up the sort of um, uh, noise, the visual noise, the sort of bits of ink and so on that are left on the page if you keep uh, photocopying it right towards the end. It embodies the idea of a tautological process, if you like. The, um, okay. So Solowitz's last, um, 35th and last sentences on conceptual art says, these sentences comment on art but are not art. The first issue of Art Language made a stronger kind of point. Um, the first issue of Art Language was where Solowitz published his sentences for the first time. It asked the question, what would follow for the art community of language users if this editorial meaning the text that you were reading right that at, at that time, came up for the count as a work of art. So that's the first moment that a text about art that asked um, its, the question about itself as art asked it in a text that you were actually reading. So it's this set of innovations, I think, that allow me to make this uh, second uh, proposition. Remember, the first proposition was that um, conceptualism, in its first instance, was a set of practices for interrogating what it was for perceiving subjects and perceived objects to be in the world. That's to say, it was an inquiry into the minimal situations in which art might be possible. It was also, and during the later 60s and 70s, it became an integrated set of practices for interrogating the conditions under which the first question becomes possible and becomes necessary. Conditions, in this case, means the intellectual, the conceptual conditions, not the real conditions in the world, but the conditions of, uh, of thinking. That's to say it became an inquiry into the maximal conditions for art to be thought. First one is about art to become possible as works, as objects, in effect. The second one is about art to be thought. Okay. So we've arrived at the key moment of conceptual art, uh, where it's recognised as a art movement, capital C, capital A. Common consensus says that it occurs in the uh, exhibition or recognised in the exhibition Conceptual Art, Conceptual Aspects in New York in 1970, curated by Donald Kazan with uh, Joseph Kosuth and Ian Byrne, fact as the ghost curators. Now note that a double has already appeared, Conceptual Art and Conceptual Aspects um, means that there is conceptual art, but there are also some stuff that is like conceptual art, that has qualities or aspects that are sort of conceptual. So already there's a, um, uh, a division going on. That leads me to the uh, third proposition that I'll make here. This is the third of my three propositions. Um, put them together and you've got, I think, um, something like a theory of what conceptualism is when it becomes conceptual art. The third one is that the conditions, the actual social, language, cultural and political conditions in the world of the first two practices that I pointed out become problematized. They become made problematic. As was communicative exchange as such, it wasn't just that we accepted that communicative exchange was the thing we had to do now, as Boris points out, that was accepted as problematic, as something in itself was extremely problematic, difficult to do, not easy to do at all. So it became an inquiry, uh, inquiry itself became an, an active engagement in the pragmatic conditions that might generate a defeasible sociality. That's a long-winded long way of saying, can we become social? through this kind of inquiry. Can we re-engage with the world, but differently? So art and language work at that point, and the core of it um, appears in works such as this index project, 
1972 documenta where the artists um, give you index cards to access the sheets that are on the wall that are records of discussions within the group um, about work. Um, artists at this point start to take up the analytical procedures of the first two phases of conceptualism, apply them to real life actual situations. Again, this occurred differently in different times and different places. Hans Harker took this up and applied it to in the Sapolsky real estate work, very famous work in 1971. Mary Kelly took it up and applied it in her postpartum document series to the uh, experience of motherhood. Less known are works, I'm sorry these are so hard to read, but um, by Martha Wilson, this is a, what she called her chauvinistic piece of 1971. For example, um, unknown piece. A woman is prevented from knowing the identity of her partner by give, being given a sleeping pill, a blindfold, or the total darkness with certainty. On the evidence of the child's features, she guesses who she slept with. And other ones. A woman selects a couple for the genetic features she admires, good teeth, curly hair, green eyes, etc., and raises their baby. These are fairly typical of nominations and routines uh, for work during that period. It is almost as if the 1960s, the great moment of free love, was being organized along the lines of um, Plato's Republic. So transformations were occurring even within art language. Um, they occurred in uh, projects such as Blurting in A&L, 1973, which was gained a series of records of discussions between members of the group in New York. We produced this um, booklet, which gave you um, ways of accessing the conversation through various key terms that kept occurring uh, in the conversation. The uh, draft for an anti-textbook that I did with Ian and Mel as an issue of art language, was really about provincialism in theory and practice, um, as well as a number of other things. Uh, similarly, the art and language work we did in Australia in 1975 was very much related to the politics of the situation uh, during that period, um, in form of discussions and so on and so forth. Uh, eventually, that took form for the New York group and the Fox magazine, if you read that, it's a very intensely uh, political um, project. Canadian artists who were members of our group, Carl Beveridge and Carol Conde, produced a comic book, It's Still Privileged Art, based on uh, Maoist um, uh, comic books that were all around Chinatown uh, during that period at the uh, end of the Cultural Revolution. A number of us continued doing this kind of work um, in Australia and Canada, um, uh, applying the techniques of conceptualism, uh, conceptual art practice to creating embedded political art for trade unions and political groups um, throughout um, in different parts of the world. Okay, the final part of my talk is about conceptualism after conceptual art, when it appeared as a new term in art discourse. So I wanted, uh, and here I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, conceptualism in, in Russia. The key question when we look at examples of art produced in a conceptual uh, manner or seemingly conceptual mode after the early 70s, the key question is this. Are we looking at delayed or belated examples of conceptualism or simply particular, peculiar and other instances of the first two parts of my proposition? Are we looking at a local instance of the third part of my proposition, the more politically embedded thing? Or, or is there a fourth sense, a fourth sense, one that should be added to the three ideas that I've already advanced? So my answers will be yes, no, and yes. We've got one and three ideas. The whole point about one and three ideas is that you can have contemporaneousness and non-contemporaneity at the same time. So I'll explore two instances. I think when Boris Groys coined the term romantic, sorry, Moscow romantic conceptualism in 1979, he created a verbal artifact that I believe attempted to stand at the same critical distance from international art discourse and to its own circumstances of production that he understood the art itself 
to stand. First point. He was writing for readers in France who would presumably read it in English, but above all writing so it would be read here in, in uh, this city and elsewhere in a clandestine fashion. He wanted to draw attention to how deeply embedded this kind of work was in the specific conditions of what it was to make art in Moscow, in a small apartments for small groups, to an awkward, embattled, ironic inwardness, the inwardness of this work. Paradoxically, I get the sense that the artists involved wished to be anywhere but Moscow, actually wished to be out of this place, but could not be out of this place. You can tell me whether I'm right or wrong about that. So the first term, Moscow, is an irony, uh, is, a non, is a description, but also a non-description of, of where the thing is located. Secondly, in a society that ignored or repressed these artists and condemned to uh, kind of um, condemned them to the kind of resignation that filled what later in the article he calls the Russian soul, like a kind of lead balloon. So you have the, this, this so-called romantic conception of what it is to have a Russian soul weighing down on you like a lead balloon. The artist could only dream of being regarded as paragons of the heightened subjectivism that the German or the English romantics did. So romanticism, maybe from an external point of view, is about heightened subjectivism and its power and being recognised for having it. That was not what was going on, I don't think, I don't believe, here in the later 70s and during the 80s. But dream, uh, dream is what the artists did. And why not? Because dreams are cheap. Dreams don't cost anything. They only cost your psychic. They have psychic costs. Um, but you don't have to buy them <laughs> or pay for them, at least for a moment. So romantic does, is not accurate specifically either, uh, but it does have a, a very local sense and a very general sense, uh, as Nikolai told me uh, yesterday here. Finally, the art stood at a deliberate distance from the concerns and character of US and European conceptual art as I've discussed it. So by conceptualism, Boris, I think, meant that this art was like um, such art in its self-reflective character, but in reverse, precisely in its deliberate effort to be intuitive, elusive, and affective. In other words, to be non-conceptual from the point of view of strict conceptualism. So in other words, each of the three terms in uh, Boris's concept had its opposite built into it. And that's why I think it's a very acute term, very exact term as an art critical artifact. I think he got it right. So in the uh, 1989 issue of um, Aya, um, the, this, the work by Bulatov was on the uh, front cover. Uh, he offers the two definitions. First, the word conceptualism may be understood in the narrower sense as designating a specific artistic movement clearly limited to a place, time and origin, by which he meant what I've been talking about, my second sense uh, of, um, if you like, high conceptualism is what he meant. Um, in the revised translation that I believe is more accurate, he meant to say the last bit of the sentence is limited to, to a specific number of practitioners. The second definition is, or it may be interpreted more broadly by referring to any attempt to withdraw from considering artworks as material objects intended for contemplation um, and aesthetic evaluation. Instead, it could encourage solicitation and formation of the conditions that determine the viewer's perception of the art, the processes of its inception by the artist, its relation to factors in the environment and to its temporal status. So this is very interesting. Those are very similar words to what you've just heard me um, offer you as a um, second proposition uh, and a third proposition itself. And it's very interesting that I first wrote that kind of retrospective read of early 1970s, late 60s, early 70s conceptualism in 1980, one year after <laughs> Boris wrote something similar here um, for, for you to read. Um, so, obviously, the second uh, description ties everything a bit more closely to the Moscow group, 
um, but of course it's more general uh, in its character. The word romantic, as you all know, got dropped in the years after 1989, uh, when this art, as distinct from modernist or informal protest art, began to be read as a prefiguration of the collapse of the Soviet system and as the basis for all subsequent art in Russia of any seriousness. That's another claim that some of you might want to dispute, but that's how it looks from outside the country. Boris's open-endedness also enables us to see that other artists carrying on the spirit of the Moscow Romantic conceptualists, albeit in uh, unorthodox ways. And his key exemplars are Andrei Monastersky and the Collective Actions Group that de dedicated itself, as you all well know, to actions that were a heightening of the specificity of everyday life while being at the same time scarcely distinguishable from it. But again, this is a, a more uh, conceptual um, approach than the un relatively unreflective immersion in everyday life that characterizes more contemporary art. Medical hermeneutics made work from speculation about whether such actions were indeed art or whether they were life. To me, the real parallels to work such as Ilya uh, Kavakov's Answers of the Experimental Group, 1971, which Matthew Jesse Jackson says is the original moment of Moscow conceptualism. The parallels here to me are with the interrogatory nature of late 50s, early 60s work of Johns Rauschenberg and Warhol, which I've suggested is conceptual in the broad sense of the term. More precisely, it accords with my first proposition, a set of practices for interrogating what it was for perceiving subjects and perceived objects to be in the world. Moscow conceptualism is not consonant with my second proposition, uh, exemplified by the adorness negativity of criticality of Kasuth and art language and so on. Yet it is in quite specific ways an instance of the third proposition. The fact that it was produced after the institutionalization and the wide publication of conceptual art means that one element in its makeup was a refusal of such art, a sense that to adopt its modes uh, strictly would be irrelevant to local concerns and circumstances. So I don't see any artist working in the Soviet sphere as producing classical conceptual art in my second sense. I do see people producing work in the first sense and in the third sense, uh, if you like. But it is inflected by the fact that the second sense existed and it was kind of refused. So I'll now um, finish in a couple of minutes, is that okay, uh, Nikolai, by just drawing your attention to the second and most influential way in which the idea of conceptualism was spread around the world through the uh, exhibition um, Global uh, Conceptualism, Points of Origin, 1950s to 1980s, where they distinguished two um, waves of activity, again, um, from the late 50s to 1973, a worldwide political changes leading artists to call into question the underlying ideas of art and its institutional systems, and then a period from the mid 70s until the end of the 80s, when artists mostly outside Euro-America abandoned formalist or traditional art practices for conceptualist art. And I'll, I'll, we're running out of time, so I'll just give you a summary. This is a, a big claim that uh, conceptual modes were in fact applied to what I would call uh, this kind of third phase of conceptualism and that that kind of practice is as significant as art being produced anywhere else and indeed in works such as Louis Kamnitz's um, uh, Uruguay Torture Series that's absolutely true um, and in that sense sh this work should receive uh, enormous recognition the claim that most of it is conceptual is, I think, less important than the claim that it is significant uh, and, and important political work that's about contemporary situations and contemporary circumstances, and in that sense, it should be part of the history of contemporary art as it was appearing at this time. Whether it's conceptual uh, in any strict sense is less important to the debate. So let me conclude with just a couple of remarks about the open-ended sense of conceptualism that's now um, become quite common, uh, that any art uh, that in some ways uh, echoes the sort of work we've been discussing uh, 
uh, can be regarded as conceptual. And maybe, you know, that's, that's fair enough. Um, but as you can tell, for me, it's kind of crucial that these issues of consequence and these issues of a particular um, uh, very deep and obsessive commitment to conceptual analysis um, really should be uh, v valued and <laughs> whenever we call uh, work conceptual. Otherwise, there are other words. All work does not have to be conceptual. Let me just include, conclude with a couple uh, of examples. If um, you look at this relatively unknown work by Joseph, one and five clocks, one and five clocks, you're broken out of the absolutely tautological mode of object, image, and definition that's become imprinted as almost a closed system in most people's minds about what conceptual uh, art is. Here you find him searching uh, and looking across definitions. Uh, the definitions, I'm sorry, you can't really see them, but they're definitions not about time, they're about mechanization and they're uh, about materiality. So the definitions are, are much kind of, uh, they're not as tautological as most of his work then became. So he's uh, searching in this case, and we can compare it to a work such as this, that it's becoming uh, virtually iconic, Untitled Perfect Lovers. Um, what we see uh, here is um, an effort, obviously it's an inheritance of um, conceptualism, and it uses the idea of repetition and the idea of uh, uh, an image to stand for an idea, in this case of time, the two clocks, uh, as we know, um, repeat the idea of time um, in a mechanical way, but two clocks, even the most mechanical, will gradually slow down at a different rate, and eventually they'll show a slightly different time, and eventually they'll stop showing any kind of time at all. And Anton has just arrived on time. <laughs> uh, these two clocks, are actually symbolic of the coupling of Felix Gonzalez Torres and his lover, uh, who died of AIDS as he did shortly thereafter. So these clocks are really, um, they have a different kind of character to Joseph's ability to choose any kind of image and put next to any kind of work um, to make any kind of point, which is partly a remark that Boris very usefully made uh, in discussion in London quite recently, Americans at that time had choices. Uh, as I say, in the 70s and 80s, people in advanced cultures had choices about what kind of art they would make and what they could do. In many cultures, people didn't have that kind of choice, um, definitely not that freedom of choice. In the case of this work, the only choice left for people in a time of AIDS was about the manner in which they died including whether they died together. And to use one of Boris's terms, um, they could become comrades in death or even comrades of a dying time, which is what I think was going on. So you see, consequence is different depending on where you are and what time that you're in. And this above all is what we need to pay attention to when we are trying to think about terms such as conceptualism. Thanks very much. Thank you.